Simple Beep, Episode 1, Startup Chime. Welcome to Simple Beep, a podcast looking back at the history of Apple and the Mac community. I'm Ed Cormany. And I'm Brian Satorius. And welcome to this new project of ours, a new Apple podcast. And you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I don't need another one of those. But we think we're going to contribute something new to the Apple podcast space. We've both been using Macintosh computers for a long time, multiple decades. And so we have uh, an understanding of where the Mac has come from. We'd like to revisit it. Yeah, we're not the oldest of old timers. We haven't been there from the very beginning. But for me, I've been using a Mac for a little over 20 years now. First Mac in my family was in 1994, one of the first Power Macs. And my dad uh, bought a Mac too. Uh, right around the time I was born. And so there's always been Macs in my family. So yeah, we're going to start at the beginning, though. And today's topic, we're going to begin with the startup chime, one of the most iconic pieces of the Mac experience. And really, the way that your experience with the Mac itself uh, begins. Very fitting for a first episode. Yeah, so... You know, this was something new when when the Mac was introduced, that you would have some sort of I don't know, pleasing sound uh, when your computer started up, or sound at all, because this was the era of you know, PCs with no sound cards. Right. You would have to buy a, a Sound Blaster Pro from Creative or something like that just to yeah. get in the door. Yeah. So the the thing is, though, that for people who are maybe newer to the Mac, they don't understand or haven't realized that there's a longer history here because the the chime that the Mac makes today uh, has been unchanged for 15 years, basically, since 1999 was the introduction of the first Mac that had this same chime. But maybe if you go back further, you might think of something else as being more like the real Mac startup chime. So, Brian, what do you think is like, what, what comes to mind when you think Mac startup chime? Uh, the computer, the Mac computer that I used the most growing up was a, uh, a 6100 class Power Mac, which uh, did not actually have the kind of multi-layered and textured chime that we all know today. It was a, a guitar uh, chord being plucked. And uh, it, was, it was very abrupt. And I will always remember, or I was always think of that as the Mac startup chime. Yeah, so that that was actually one of the one of the more different ones. And here, this is what that one sounded like. Yeah, so you know, that that's not what a Mac sounds like today. Yeah, not but, at all. Uh, n- not at all. But you know, in in the same family because you know it it's a chord. And, you know, you said not as many layers, but there's a lot of notes in that chord. Yes, yeah. Um, And we'll go into the exact details of that in a little bit. For me, I don't know. I think of it as something that's a bit closer to the current one. I think it's actually a variation of the current one, which came out around... I associated it with the uh, this sort of second generation of Power Max, the 6500, 7500, 8500 Power Max. Um, which is still that big, uh, big, bold chord, uh, this one. I just remember that there was a, a Mac lab in school where it was lots of older Macs, uh, but the the instructor had a Power Mac 8500 and this ridiculous speaker setup. And that whenever he started <laughs> up the computer, it was, you know, it was jacked all the way up and you got that huge chord and it was just a really powerful sound. And, and that's still the sound that we hear now, even if it's coming out of little MacBook Air speakers. That's more or less still what we're hearing. I think the last part of what you just said is what makes my choice interesting for like what I think of as the chime is because the more modern the Macs I've used uh, have become, the less frequently I actually restart them. So there are fewer opportunities to hear uh, the startup chime, whereas the Mac I used growing up, uh, it was a desktop that was plugged in and, uh, you know, it's sleeping it, even if I don't even know if it was possible, but it wouldn't didn't even make that much sense. So there was always the shutting down and the starting up. So I probably heard that chime many more times. Literally uh, every day. Literally every day. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to 
uh, for what the last 10 years, I've used a laptop that I usually just uh, put to sleep and wake up again, which is silent. Right, and you check uptime on your on your MacBook now, and it's oh, twenty seven days or something. Like right. you haven't heard that sound in a long, long time. Exactly. Um, and maybe the last time that you did, it was muted, and so like, <laughs> yeah. you can go months without hearing hearing these chimes now. Um, whereas before, they were they were really part of the Mac computing experience. It was every day, and sometimes many times a day. <laughs> yeah, especially um, if you're having a bad day. Well, yeah, because, you know, back in the mid 90s, the system seven days, things were not stable. It, you know, you could be working on a single project and just be hitting crash after crash after crash. And where today that would be, oh, such and such app has unexpectedly quit. If you even get that far, mm-hmm. you know, then it was I have to restart my Mac and you heard it again. <laughs> so, yeah, conceptions of what what you think of as the chime would would change over time. So let's actually roll back uh, to 1984 before our time with the Mac, right. but uh, do do a little deep dive on the history of of what happened here. Uh, and so the way that the Mac got a startup chime at all, uh, it turns out, was because of an Apple II engineer who, according to this story that we have a link in the show notes on folklore.org which is an interesting little site with lots of yeah. sort of insider stories from the early days of Apple. And they're all very entertaining. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fun site. Uh, so according to this story, it was, a, it was an Apple II engineer who had come onto the Mac team. He was definitely an audio guy, and they were all working in machine code and assembly language because you know, the resources were so limited on the, on, you know, the first. These are prototype Macs. In, in 1982. And if you remember back to the Apple II, apparently they, they also made uh, some sort of a sound when you turned them on. Uh, actually here, the, the 2GS apparently had this sort of like abrupt chord. Just like a, a boop. <laughs> yeah. You know, n- nothing that you would call a chime or a chord even really. Uh, just a hello. Yes, you push the power button. Uh, kind of, kind of notice and they were looking to sort of extend that for for the mac and make something pleasing sounding and so they were working on this basic hardware um here the the engineer's name was charlie kellner says here and so they made the code that played this nice nice pitch and then he said hey can i take uh take a prototype home to over the weekend to play with it a little bit more and he took the actual Mac prototype home. He's like, this sounds terrible. It's like stuck inside the case and the case muffles the sound. It's not as beautiful as I hoped it would be. And so he, he actually got out like some power tools and drilled. a. This sounds insane, right? Like drilled a hole in the side of a prototype Mac you know, two years before its release and then brings it back to work. And shows it to Steve Jobs. And uh, even though there was an improvement in the, in the clarity of the sound, Steve Jobs was Steve Jobs. And he didn't like the aesthetic uh, degradation of the case. He didn't like the big, ugly hole in it. And uh, he decided there wasn't enough of an improvement in the sound's clarity uh, to cover for a big, ugly hole in the side. So he nixed it. Yeah, but the sort of ironic thing is that they kept the sound and the case. And and the guy who created the sound just went back to the Apple II team because he was like, I've had it with you people. But we got his sound, um, which is this uh, tritone chord. Um, and this is the original Mac startup sound that, you know, came along with a lot of things that were unfamiliar in a computer startup, you know, because we also had the introduction of the Happy Mac. Yes. With with the first Macintosh. So you know, no computer ever showed a little smiling icon at you and made this sound when it turned on before. Mm-hmm. So that was really, you know, something new. And as we know, something that became uh, really part of the iconography, you know, the the it's one of these iconic symbols of the Mac. Right. And uh, we'll get into... 
uh, Jim Reeks a little later, but in an interview with him, he describes this tone, the the concept of a chime in general, as an ear con, as a, opposed to an icon. Um, and it, it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jim Reeks is a character. We're going to get to him. He's he's the Sosumi guy, so you know that he's a a, a bit of a character if you know that story. <laughs> it actually had a real utility, and the the chime and the Happy Mac icon were the result of a couple firmware tests that the computer does that actually lets you know, A, you've successfully pressed the power button, and B, that the hardware so far has all checked out as okay. Right, so it's taking that additional step beyond just power is happening to really this computer is functioning and starting up. And if you've ever used, you know, like a a Mac 128K, they start up very quickly. Hi, I'm on. Yeah. <laughs> this this is happening. So for the next few iterations of the Mac, um, I guess for about six, seven years then, uh, through the Mac 2 and the Mac LC line, uh, and I presume also the Mac Classic line in there, they stuck with these sort of simple chimes, although there were some some improvements over the original simple tritone written just in assembly language. They actually went to, you know, recorded digitized sounds. Um, So that happened with the Mac 2 and the Mac, uh, the LC. That one sounds even more, you know, like a more rich sound. But those chords are all really simple chord, one note in the same family. If you heard those, you know, you might associate those with the Mac, but you certainly wouldn't associate those with a 21st century Mac. Right. They still sound very digital, uh, keeping in with the way that uh, robotics and computers were portrayed in the late 80s, early 90s. Exactly. But we know that we got to more more advanced sounds. And that one from the LC... That gives you an idea that we're headed in that direction. That sounds like a recording, not a synthesis, even if it was being synthesized, you know, on the fly every time that you turned on the Mac. What could we do with that? What, what, you know, once you're able to put in any recorded sound, the sky's the limit, right? So enter Jim Reeks. He was a developer for Apple from, for almost all, all of the 80s and up through 1999. I guess he's a musician as well, and he was working on sound design for Apple. And there's an interview with him that we've posted in the show notes, and we're going to have a quote from it in a little bit, but we definitely cannot quote all of it, um, at least if we don't want to keep a clean tag on this podcast, which I think we do. Uh, Reeks is a bit of a character and not afraid to shoot his mouth off <laughs> yeah. about about all sorts of things that happened in the early days of Apple. But it sounds like he went on sort of a one-man crusade to update and change the startup chime from beyond the, the LC sound. Here's a quote about he, he worked on the chime and he... He says he sort of slid it in, you know, late night commit under the, you know, under you know, flying under the radar uh, for the Quadra 700, um, which I guess was the first of the Quadra line. This is a sound that is much closer to what what we think of. Sounds a lot more like a Mac. And he has a, he has a really great quote about um, what goes into this sound like there's a there's a lot going on there much more than just like three notes in a chord here he is so i just ended up fooling around and playing different chords and you know it's it's a big fat c major chord with um a, a lot of thick rich sonic textures behind it it was a stereo sound it phased back and forth there's a little bit of a stereo reverb and um there's a, a a sharp transient little chiffy sound that you would get like off of a flute or a pan flute like a you know a bamboo flute there's a little bit of that there's a bunch of string sounds in it and anyway it had enough richness in it that it would sound recognizable no matter how you played it so this is him talking about the sound just you know a couple years ago in an interview in a coffee shop hence the the audio quality 
he really uh, has a deep understanding of all the pieces of this sound just from from the things that he says there. And you can you can hear them like, you know, he says there's that the chiffy sound where it's sort of like a, a hit on on a flute um, sort of breathy sound um, and that it's got reverb and strings in it. And, you know, he's been hearing variations of this sound ever since, but to be able to just, you know, come in and describe it in that way, like he really knew what he was doing, building this sound and, you know, everything that he's, that he mentioned is there in that, in that sound. Kind of going back to the first boot beep, the speakers in our Macs are way better than the ones that were in 1984, but they still will never compare to a good set of dedicated speakers or headphones. And if you have uh, external speakers or headphones plugged into your computer's phone jack uh, while you boot it up, you can drive that startup chime through it and start to hear some of these things that he's talking about that you might not have not have ever noticed. Yeah, the little fade back and forth. And, you know, it's not just a mono sound, even though most of the Macs at the time probably only had a mono built-in speaker or were relying on a monitor or external speakers. But he, like he said, he wanted it to scale. He wanted it to be at least recognizable on, like, the worst speaker. The, you know, the most terrible tin can <laughs> that they would, you know, cram into, well, probably a, a, a power book in those days but should sound great on, you know, on a real stereo rig. So that was the sound that, that began Jim Reek's uh, reign over, over Mac startups. Um, but that's not the one that we hear today. A very close relative of it is a few years later um, in 99, which I guess was his last year with the company. So he, he was there for a couple years um, after after Steve Jobs came back. Uh, and he has a line in that interview, apparently. He says that Steve Jobs wanted, quote, the good one for the startup sound of the iMac. <laughs> and what he meant was the sound of, he, he says the Quadra, but it's, it's really the one of the Quadra AV, which it, anyone who is using a Mac today, even if you haven't heard booted your Mac in, you know, two months, will will recognize. If you weren't paying attention, you would say, yeah, that's the exact sound that my you know, 2014 Mac makes. But it's not quite. That sound has stuck around for 15 years. We said the chime is unchanged. But there have been some slight modifications and modulations. I think that it might only be modulations. So the, the sound has definitely been pitch shifted to the current startup chime. And I'm not sure, because I think that when I listen to it, I hear a little bit less of, well, there's certainly less of the chiffy noise going from the Quadra to the Quadra AV even. So this was the Quadra. This is the Quadra AV. Like less of that breathy hit at the beginning. Here's a, the sound that all Macs are using today. Right? So it, it's definitely lower. I can't really tell whether anything has been added or subtracted or whether just those sort of higher frequency breathy sounds just fade in as it's been as it's been lowered down. I'm with you there. I can that's all my uh untrained ears can get that it's it's lower. Uh maybe it drags on a little longer. Well, yeah, because but I think it's been pitch shifted and you know just fully lengthened, mm -hmm. lengthened to do the pitch shift, not um, keeping in the same, not keeping time. in the same, same time. So it's gone from, you know, two point some seconds to three seconds. Um, and there are three different pitches from the beginning to some of the later power max. That's the 8,500 that I said is like, yeah, <laughs> that's the, that's the, that's the big, big booming chord in the computer lab. Um, and then today's a little bit lower, but that's not the whole history of the startup chime. There are a few others that have been 
on on the outside. So Brian mentioned the the first Power Max, 6100, 7100, 8100, had a a guitar riff. So this is this is again, it's a recorded sound. And it was recorded uh not by Jim Reeks, but by a professional jazz guitarist, Stanley Jordan. Uh, and something interesting Ed found out uh, while putting together the links for this episode is that Stanley Jordan, uh, because he had a career outside recording chimes for the Mac, has a full Wikipedia page. But Jim Reek's Wikipedia page merely redirects to an entry for Sosumi. Yes, Stanley Jordan has quite a career outside of outside of this one chord. And again, a lot going on here. I don't think that you know, they would have settled for just like a three, four note chord strummed on a guitar. They they were looking again for some, you know, some of that sonic richness. And so everything that I've heard about this is that it's played on a 12 string guitar. Oh, um, which I guess it's usually just doubled six strings, right? It, it, it definitely gives some more depth to the sound. And like, there's, there's still a lot of notes in there. In fact, to me, it almost sounds like it, it sounds like one of those chords that's had a note added. It's like there's one too many chords in there or one too many notes in the chord. Um, not the big C major chord like on the other Max. Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing discordant in, in the standard you know, 2014 startup chime, but there's, there's something a little bit off, at least to my ear in the, the Power Max, and of course, yeah, you know, I I grew up as well with a with a Power Max sixty one hundred that crashed all the time. This is one of the things Jim Reeks talked about too uh, in the interview. He says, he says I don't want people. You know, people are going to associate this sound with crashing their computers. Yeah, <laughs> and I want it to be something. He called it a palate cleanser. Like he he wanted it to be something that was pleasing rather than than discordant. And I think maybe maybe I think that the sixty one hundred is so discordant because I heard it so many times after my Mac had dropped into Max bug and everything was gone. Uh, there are a couple other ones as well. Some of these were new to me just because I never had any primary experience with these models of the Mac. So there was the Power Mac 5200 and 5300 series, which was sort of, this was in the time after the Quadra and the Centris had been phased out, I think, and the LC and the Performa and the Power Mac had all sort of merged together into sort of one Mac line because, you know, all the hardware, the, the processor hardware was up to the PowerPC now. Um, but we had these spiritual successors to previous classic Mac lines. And I don't know what the story is behind the Power Mac 5200. I mean, this was in the time of touting more, I think, AV features in the Mac. There was the Mac AV, well, the Quadra AV, and then there was the Mac TV. It could. It came with a remote. It had a TV tuner card. It had, it the was, case was black, which yeah. was a big deal at the time. Um, so this, I, I think this was sort of in that same vein um, and sort of a, a, a different take on the big C major chord, um, which, of course, is now no longer a C major chord with the it shifts, but it started as a big C major chord. So here's here's what the 5200 sounded like. Now I can imagine that if that was the sound that the Power Mac 8500 made, that I heard growing up, you know, attached to the big sound system, I would think that was the one. This one, yeah, this one is very complex. It's not just like uh, a rich composition with layers of uh, notes and chords building to kind of one consistent sound but there's the the chord and then underneath you can hear kind of like a a pulsing bass line um i remember encountering this i think i had to work at a computer lab that had one of these uh in a condition where i had to wear headphones and i remember that i would hear the the underlying bass line through the headphones uh every time i had to reboot but not necessarily through the built-in speakers yeah, another thing I just noticed with this one is it's it's got like a noticeable fade out at the end. Where whereas the other ones, you know, like the the guitar riff, like it naturally fades, but that's just how the acoustics of the guitar are. Like 
obviously the chord does the note doesn't last forever like it's attenuated but here it sounds like they actually ducked the chime at the end which is sort of i don't know it's a little less assertive than than some of the others this one's the most uh like a musical production almost like you could this could be at the beginning of a fantasy movie or something like that <laughs> right and speaking of fantasy movies and soundscapes of course you know <laughs> the most artistic of all of these and has to be, of course, the 20th anniversary Macintosh, which, you know, was was a beast unto itself. Uh, it had this this strange design with the, the flip open CD uh, CD tray in the front um, actually looks, you know, it, it's very much along the same lines as what modern iMacs look like, but was totally unheard of uh, 10 years ago. An all-in-one design with a flat screen instead of a CRT. But, you know, far, far before the Retina 5K iMac, you know, we're, we're talking very different display technology here. And again, you know, the different color case. Um, it, was, it was really something different, and so they created a, a distinct chime for it. And this one, it's just, it's just so happy. You know, the, the 20th anniversary Mac was, you know, it was really more celebrating the Mac than being a utilitarian Mac model. The 20th anniversary Mac was very expensive, produced in limited quantities. So it makes sense that this was the sort of thing that accompanied its startup. I don't know the exact details on the the history of the 20th anniversary Mac, but I want to say that sound, to whoever designed it, sound was a, a very important part of the machine. It had, it had Bose branded uh, speaker components. I think it had uh, the tweeters built into the computer body itself, but an external, like, full-size subwoofer. Not optional. That was part of the Mac. Included with it, right. And so, of course, they're going to make a sound that uh, shows off the system that they're undoubtedly High and low of. end, you know, because yeah. there's definitely a, a strong base in that one as, as well, but then that that sort of tweeting almost like bird-like <laughs> yeah. noise at, at, at the top end. Um, so yeah, you know, I don't, I, I think we're better off that that's not the sound that followed from every Mac after that. Yeah. It's a little much. It's a little much, you know, hearing that go off in a computer lab or in library might, you know, might be too much. Um, it's interesting that those are the sort of artistic directions that people at Apple say, you know, 10 years ago when told, make a startup chime, but really, you know, turn up the art artistry on it to 11. That That's the kind of sound that comes out of it. But of course, uh, from 1999, as Ed said, on to today, we've settled upon the one canonical chime. Yep. And this has been used not only as a symbol of the Mac, but as a more general symbol of Computing, robots, all kinds of things in, in pop culture. So one, one that's most, most well-known, and of course is there because of the Apple connection, is in the Pixar film WALL-E, where, now I haven't seen WALL-E in a while, but <laughs> I think it's later in the movie where he's, his power has depleted, and then he charges himself back up using solar panels, and and starts back up and like when he comes back to life the the startup chi the the canonical chime the the jim reeks chord plays and he he comes back to life and he can go wow again <laughs> yeah i remember uh watching wally -E in the theaters in the san francisco bay area and uh People in the theater laughed when that happened. I remember yeah, very clearly. Or, or cheered or applauded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's certainly recognizable in those contexts as well. Uh, also, another piece of uh, pop culture, one of the early episodes of Futurama involves the, uh, the main cast going to a, uh, a robot-driven planet that is uh, very hostile towards humans. They even uh, participate in a daily uh, human hunt, which I think they say has been unsuccessful for like 
four hundred days in a row or something. Uh, it's a, it's it's those crafty humans. It, yeah, uh, but the start of the human hunt every day is a robot uh, raising a trumpet to his robot face and blowing through, and of course, it makes that same Mac startup chime. There are certainly many others, but those are the ones that we were able to find. One other thing that's notable about the the current chime is that it is now trademarked. And so Apple was awarded a trademark on the sound uh, in 2012. And you can find the, the patent uh, documents online. We've linked that in the show notes. And th- the fun thing is that with this application, they had to include both the sound file, but also a description of the sound as you have to describe your trademark. And part of the description is actually plotting it out on a musical staff. And, and to anyone who's played music, this, this actually looks like fairly daunting, (laughs) you know, because, you know, Jim Reek says, oh yeah, I was just playing around with some chords and, you know, big fat C major chord. But you look at this and it says it's, it's got a treble clef, but it's down an octave. And then it's in six flats, which I do not remember which key that is. But it's one of those keys where you, you get a piece of music and you see six flats and you go, oh, do we even have to play this? <laughs> you know, that's always hard. And then it's got, it does, it has, um, has five notes. So uh, one, three, five notes and then doubled uh, below. And one other thing that they note is that I guess, you know, to make it so you can't just go exactly play the Mac startup chime on your average piano or synthesizer, the the no, the whole chord part of that pitch shifting that they did, presumably, is it's not tuned to any standard musical note. The the patent says that the A used in uh the A reference A note reference for this chord is 432.4 hertz, where a standard orchestra tuning is usually a 440 hertz. So just that eight hertz of a difference, if you, you know, if you if you gave this musical staff to an orchestra and said, everybody play this note, and then you turned on a Mac in the same room, it would sound terrible <laughs> because it would be way out of tune. But it's another thing that that makes it unique. So yeah, they call it a a sound mark consisting of a slightly flat by approximately 30 cents G flat slash F sharp major chord. Oh, I guess that's the key of G flat. It's like all the flats almost. <laughs> it, it, that is all the flats, seven flats, six flats. So yeah, the trademark has been granted. And one thing that I noticed in the trademark filing, one of the things you have to include is the audio recording itself. So we've been playing these chimes throughout the show and the way that uh, we've been playing them is through an excellent app called Mac Tracker, which is available both for a uh, separate download or on the Mac App Store. I'm pretty sure it's free from both both ways. Yeah, I think so. And it has all of the statistics on every Mac model and as well as many other Apple products uh, to the beginning of time. And one of the things that it has is you can click on the little icon of each Mac and it'll play its startup chime. So I got easy access to these by actually going into the application bundle and pulling out all the sound files <laughs> which were in there. And apparently so did someone at Apple because I downloaded the the chime from the trademark office website and it has some, you know, random, I don't know if it was random or if it matched the patent application number. But the, the, it was just string of digits dot mp3. But then I opened it up and it had uh, mp3 uh, metadata info in it. And it said album Mac startup chimes artist Mac tracker. <laughs> so in the patent filing, you know, someone at Apple said, oh, we got to include the, the startup chime in our patent filing. Um, where can we get that from? Like, do we? How are we going to? Rec- oh well, I, you, you can just grab it from Mac Tracker. They've got one. <laughs> so Mac Tracker, invaluable resource inside and outside of Apple. So uh, Apple, it, it's trademarked. So Apple has protection from people who might want to uh, uh, use it without attribution. Uh, there, are... at least, at least in a serious context. In a serious not, context, you know, right? To 
profit from it, maybe. I'm guessing Wally would fall under the category of parody. If it didn't, you know, there were plenty of friendships there to to get the the permission for that. Yeah, I think um, so. Futurama, definitely parody. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Ed found another parody of the concept of the Mac Chime, which we'll put in the show notes. And uh, One of the things that people have been talking about and asking about from it seems the very early days of the startup chime is how do I get it to not play? Which, you know, for many of us, it's like, but that, that why would you want it to not play? Well, maybe you're in some place where it really should be quiet and, and you don't want it to play. It used to be that you could just plug in headphones and that would stop. It, it would play through the headphones always. Um, but with a lot of the newer, newer MacBooks, it plays through the internal speakers, even if you've got something in the headphone jack. And so anyone who's been to especially a college library recently, you know, you can't sit, sit there for more than an hour and not hear someone start up their Mac. Um, and this one video that we've posted has taken that to a comedic extreme by by taking the Mac startup chime and doing some editing work on it, let's let's say, <laughs> so that it, it becomes a bit more of a nuisance than than it might have been. But yeah, um, uh, like Ed said, that there. Um, if you can, if you do a Google search, you can find preference panes, uh, standalone utility applications that uh, will alter the volume of the startup sound. Uh, usually, just mute it because that's what people are looking for. Uh, or if you, if you don't want to plug in headphones for some reason, but want a lo-fi way to mute. Uh, on some older machines, people were recommending uh, maybe snipping off the the jack of a pair of broken headphones and just sticking it in there so that it some, would play Some through. people also suggested even just like basically shorting out your headphone jack with either like like a nail or a screw inserted in it, you know, just to touch the contacts and fool it to think that, you know, because then you wouldn't even wouldn't even make any noise, not even in little headphones. Um, but yeah, people have been complaining about it for forever. I have, I have this great quote from, uh, I dug out a bunch of old MacBooks, uh, not Mac books, not the computers books about Macs. This one is from voodoo Mac, which was published in 1991 and it's delightful. And they have a, they have a tip in the book that says, turn down that symphonic boot bong. <laughs> And, and, you know, this was early in the game. They say, if you have a PowerBook or a Quadra, you know that the startup sound is rather like the older Macs, but more so. <laughs> Which I, I presume Jim Reeks would be pleased with. But yeah, they thought that it was too, uh, too symphonic, even at that stage. So um, it's not just Macs all the time that are uh, maybe being opened in a college library. Uh, it, of course, you have a, the Windows machines, Dells, etc., and they have their own um, startup and shutdown tones, but it's not hardware based. I think it's it's more like when Windows is almost finished uh, booting up, and like your desktop and the start menu bar at the bottom of the screen are all there. The task bar, right? And I, I think that that all started, you know, in the Windows ninety five era. But don't quote me on that. But you know that that was the heart of the the Mac PC wars, and. We were clearly on the Mac side and it, it never quite made sense to me just because, you know, the whole point of the Mac startup chime is that you push the power button. It does the basic checks to make sure like the computer is going to start in some respect and then it plays the sound. So it's very quick feedback. Like, yes, this is going well here. Whereas the Windows ones. Yeah, you said it's like when it goes to the desktop. Yeah. But if you've ever used a Windows 95 computer, you know that it probably had like two to three minutes of stuff to do still after that before you could use it at all. So it happened like in the middle of the startup process. And that was why it always confused me. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm starting up. I'm doing the things like we're getting ready to go. Yeah, it's all going to work. Oh, can I use it now? No, no, please wait for a while. Well, then why'd you make that sound at me? <laughs> and similarly, uh, they make a shutdown sound. So like after you choose the shutdown command and hit, you confirm in the dialog box that you actually want to, there's a little sign off goodbye, which like 
just has to be for for like audio aesthetics. There's really no means to it other than I guess you need another confirmation that like yes, you have chosen to shut down your computer. Yeah, it's like old cell phones that decided that they had to make sounds whenever you turn them on or off. The iPhone has <laughs> changed so much. Yeah, maybe we should actually talk about that now. So, you know, with with the iPhone, there's no sound when you turn it on. You get the, the white Apple screen and then, you know, your phone starts up and it's ready to go. So that kind of brings up these questions of the chime has stayed the same on the Mac for 15 years. Do we think that it will ever change? Will we ever hear some new, delightful Mac startup sound? Or may it someday with, you know, as, as iOS and Mac OS come closer together, may it just drift away? Well, I think, as we mentioned before, the frequency with which Mac users hear the chime is probably going to keep going down, or maybe it's hit the the floor at which it will stay for a while just because people are shutting down or rebooting their computers less frequently. Yeah, it may, it may go away as it loses its, its utility to exist. Um, as for it changing before it goes away, if it does go away, uh, I remember that when iOS 7 came out on iPhones and iPads, uh, in addition to the different visual appearance, they redid a lot of the tones uh, that come installed on the device for right, right, because all, all the other ones got shoved into like a folder called Classic or something. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, it was clear that there was some effort there to include the sound experience under the umbrella of the redesign. And we obviously did not get a new startup chime with the release of Yosemite recently, which uh, redid the visual appearance of the Mac. Or, you know, it's it's really not tied to the operating system, but it's tied to new new hardware. And, you know, we saw really new and really daring design with the Mac Pro last year and the new Retina IMAX this year. And, you know, they still all make the same chime. And so maybe if ever if Apple ever shifts away from aluminium and glass in their hardware designs to maybe a new across-the-board aesthetic, uh, uniform aesthetic, perhaps then there may be uh, a change to the hardware tone to accompany it. But I, I think it's just going to stay the way it is and become less relevant. Yep, yep. You want to know something else that is less relevant and has actually gone away, does not exist on current Macs, is the other sound that you might hear at startup with some older Macs, the chimes of death. Again, to recap, the the startup chime was not just to acknowledge that you have turned on your computer, but it was the result of uh, positive hardware and firmware checks. So like all your, the insides of your Mac have passed a rudimentary set of tests and it's going to proceed with booting up. But if that didn't happen, you would get a different sound that would signify something is broken. Yeah, and when this started, it was it was called the chimes of death and they said, listen for an arpeggio instead of a chord. Um, and the way this worked was the, the Mac 2 was the first to have chimes of death. And I think there was a little bit of, you know, we're talking about sound design, I think there's a little bit of a problem with the message here on the Mac 2 because the the Mac 2 had that you know sort of like very simple startup chime, but the chimes of death actually sound well, kind of happy, right? It's it's that same you know like you know C major kind of chord like da da here we are. Oh, your RAM is broken. <laughs> In further iterations of the Mac 2 and the LC, they tried to make this a little bit more obvious that this was a problem, and but they did it sort of in, in very slow steps, just adding a little bit to that arpeggio to give you some cue that this really wasn't a good sound. So the, the Mac 2 CX does have a little, little extra, little extra hip. Boom. 
Ba-da-ba-dum. It, like it still finishes happy. It, it starts Halloween and it finishes happy. <laughs> but just that little hint of Halloween might give you <laughs> give you the idea that something has gone wrong. And by the time we got to the, the Mac LC, they realized, well, uh, we, we need to make this a little bit more explicit, I think. And, and you, get, you get the arpeggio and then some extra. Those last few notes really say, oh, no. Yeah, a little like Twilight Zone theme, doom. And with the, uh, with the Power Max, they decided that they were all the way to you know, full recorded sound, had more room on the ROM to put in these recorded samples. And they decided to just just go crazy with it. Make sure that you really know that your computer is broken if you hear a car crash when it starts. I'm very familiar with that sound. You are. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it was. Uh, I knew that we would we would open up the case because uh, I think there was something fishy with our receipt your ram receipt our ram there and there was something fishy with the super drive on uh on that mac i remember like discs would get stuck and the little paper clip hole to force them out didn't always work so i remember we would take the case off that mac and try to force the disc out oh, uh, man. some other ways and i'm sure that we have messed things up once or twice that directly resulted in that sound being played yep yeah, and that's the you have not put everything back in its place yeah. sound. Yeah, exactly. There are a couple others that are on the, the crashing theme, like the uh, later Power Max. It's just like glass breaking. And then there are some properly silly ones. Um, not just uh-oh Twilight Zone uh, <laughs> intimations, but this was from one of the, the Performa 5400 Really let you know that bad news was upon you. <laughs> but then decided to rub it in with the little little rim shot at the end. Yeah. Well, add insult to injury. Joke's on you. Your computer is physically broken in some way. Yeah, completely dead. We got to end with this one. It's the weirdest sound that any Mac can possibly make when it starts up. The Quadra AV Chimes of Death. It's, it's, your computer has been broken in like a cartoon jungle. And, exactly. <laughs> and the music there is is playing. That, that's another one where I, I don't think I would be really happy with what it was trying to tell me. You know, everything is broken, but in a happy cartoony way. So what does that leave us with? <laughs> Uh, a complete tour of the the history of the startup chime. Uh, it's, it had some high notes. It had some low notes. It had some arpeggiated notes. And uh, will it continue to stay the same? We think so, but who knows uh, what future iterations of Apple hardware will bring. Who knows what, it, what sounds are currently being cooked up in Johnny Ives' white room. So that brings us to the end of our episode, a full tour of the history of the Macintosh startup chime. So this is our first and only episode for now, but you'll be able to find all of our episodes in the future right on the main page of our website, which is simplebeep.com. You can also go there for links to the iTunes feed and for a feedback form. And if you have short feedback, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter. Our Twitter is at simple underscore beep. There's another at Simple Beep, which is some Japanese guy, and he would probably be very confused if you asked him questions about our podcast. You can also contact us individually. I'm at E Cormany, E C O R M A N Y. And I'm at B Suto, B S U T O. So, like we said, this is just our first episode, but we do hope to continue with this. And we think that for now, we're going to be releasing episodes about every two weeks. We like to have a uh, a little prep time. We're trying to put a lot of research into each of these topics and really bring you the full history. And we have a bunch of topics uh, chosen, and we're going to choose a very special one for our next episode coming out around Thanksgiving weekend with lots of talk about the Mac interface. Now, uh, with the release of Yosemite, we thought we'd go back to the good old days of Mac theming. 
Yeah. So when we were putting these topics together, we sort of realized that with the push forward uh, with all the new Apple technology, there was so much that we've left behind and almost forgotten about. But this was one that we definitely remembered. So we've all talked about the uh, the loss of Aqua in Yosemite. And really, the good days of Mac theming were with the kaleidoscope control panel, which spawned a whole ecosystem of people hacking, doing design, and making your Mac look like just about anything from weird steampunk machinery to torn off sheets of paper to all kinds of things. Even Windows 95, if you really wanted to. Yeah, or BOS. So uh, you have that to look forward to next time, and we hope to see you then.